I can't believe I missed suds my balls. I, gotta say <laughs> yeah, that. I was going to say, <laughs> are we not recording on this gold moment? <laughs> um, no, but that's the thing is like, you're very much somebody who is like uh, very sensitive to those nails on a chalkboard noises, mm. right? Sets me off, makes my skin crawl. Well, when I've lived with you, like when you get like a knife on a plate, that one really, it, it seems like it physically hurts you. Yeah, or like if my teeth touch a fork, I feel like I've literally. <laughs> you can't killed. do that, eh? You're one of those people that can't handle metal on teeth. No, there's also this really weird one. When I was a kid, we had this uh, plush dinosaur, and there's no reason for me to have discovered this other than I was a very young child. But I bit down on the plush dinosaur, mm-hmm. and it was this weird fibrous uh, plush, and it made. It's hard to describe the feeling like, you know, in 127 hours when he hits the nerve and the screen goes all inverted and the sound starts. That's what it was like yeah. fighting into that plush dinosaur. <laughs> it's the closest <laughs> approximation. <laughs> and then yeah. I was like, dummied for 48 hours. The score is going off and then you're all like, oh, people in the theater are throwing up, you know, <laughs> you drink some piss and you just go on with your day. Uh, that's yeah. No, I, I definitely I, I'm kind of lucky. Like I hate the dentist, but I don't I don't really get any of that sensitivity mm. on the teeth thing. Like, can you handle going to the dentist? Or does I it love bother I you? love the dentist. It's like other people doing shit in my mouth is fine. <laughs> do anything you want. Other people my mouth. can just mess my mouth up all they want, <laughs> but like if I'm trying to do it, then no, 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 no. That's not good. You know, no, if I'm having a bad like day, that. just you know, get a finger in there and mess it around. <laughs> yeah, just get his season sorry to come over and fish up your mouth a little bit. Welcome to the newest episode of Let's Watch That, the film review podcast with me, your host, Bryce Logan. There are many out there like it, but this one is mine. Uh, this episode is sponsored by Brew K. More on that a little bit later today. Brewkay.ca, I should say. Um, but hey, I'll talk about that later. So stay and uh, we'll play. Uh, oh, I can't I can't keep up with the rhyme. Um, I seem to do it all the time, but my guest today is um before i introduce him because everyone knows him he's been on the show probably might be the most you might be my most guest next to mitchell Finkbeiner, right um but uh it's a very special episode because it's my eight-year anniversary of the show um and it just happened to land on the exact day uh that I first produced an episode of the show eight years ago, Mission Impossible with uh, Chris Lennox Anson. Um, and that came out on a Wednesday when I used to think putting a podcast out on a Wednesday was a good idea. And then I subsequently uh, did not keep up a consistent schedule for years. <laughs> and uh, here we are now. But my guest was actually episode three on my show. He came on to talk about the most terrifying film of all time, E.T., The Extraterrestrial. Michael Fournier is here today. How are you doing, Mike? The guest is with the mostest. He's yes, here. Exactly. You, you've done episodes such as Prisoners, Silent Hill, The Mario Brothers, mm, uh, good Goodwill Hunting, Election. Uh, I think you did Infinity War and Endgame. Uh, it. Oh, yeah. I think you did it chapter one and chapter two. Right. Uh, E.T. That's 10 right there, but okay. there's so many more than that. I was going like, to say that one of my one of the strengths I bring to the show is my eclectic mix of features. <laughs> <laughs> like I'll bring in a bad movie once in a while. Well, should we should we tell them what today almost was? I mean, uh, I've been, they yeah. know probably because I mean, I've you've been badgering been, you about it for years. You've been trying to get Enemy Mine on the slate <laughs> for the better part of this show being around. And I don't remember why. 
It was like one day I was just like, we should do enemy mine. And you're like, <laughs> what the fuck is enemy mine? Uh, okay. You did the conversation. Oh yeah. That was another one. Uh, yeah. You did Patterson, which was a, a awakening for me when it came to mm. favorite movies of all time. You did, uh, we, you sat down and talked about 2019 movies with me. Uh, I think you did. Cause this is before I put names on the episodes, but yeah, you did it chapter two and chapter one. You did Goodwill Hunting. Um, let's see. God, you've done so many episodes. <laughs> did you do Godzilla with me? No, that was with uh, Jill. No, uh, yeah, we we watched one. the Roland Emmerich Godzilla. Uh, yeah, when that I was, was the one we on did the... for my podcast too. Yeah, did but we you and I do it on the podcast? Yeah, okay, uh, okay, okay. I've okay. done it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, we've done an incontrable amount of movies um it's 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 it's, it's an absolute atrocity it's an <laughs> unconscionable <laughs> amount of <laughs> maybe i'm using the wrong word <laughs> i don't submitting care. people to this podcast is a war crime yeah, war 11. exactly that's that's basically yeah it, it's what this this podcast is it's a war crime that's what everyone needs to be ready for but yeah you wanted to do yeah i think that's for the most part all of them but there's so many uh, you've done easily 15, 14 movies on my Good Lord, um, which is great. Mm-hmm. And I love you for it. And I really appreciate you uh, always being down to come on and talk. And that's part of the reason why I wanted you to come on for my eight year anniversary, because uh, you've known me for 13 years now. And mm-hmm. uh, I think that it's just a testament to our friendship and our uh, the podcasts that we have put out and the movies we do talk about and everything that uh, I, I I would love to, I'm really happy to have you here today. So thank you for coming on. Oh, it's a, a privilege. And uh, every day gets a little sweeter. A little yes. Rice around. Yes. Um, now you wanted to do enemy mine. <laughs> uh, correction have wanted to do enemy mine for and eight years. We will do enemy <laughs> mine on the last episode of this show. It will ever the last the closing curtain of this show will be enemy mine maybe that yeah be a big that'd be a good swan song and the what, thing a, is what like, a thud to land on. <laughs> yeah what a wet fart of a final episode <laughs> i well it's it's funny because the the reason that I, I was kind of prompted to be like okay no we got to do it this time was a the eight years thing mm-hmm. and b red letter media just did a review of enemy mine out of nowhere like two or three days ago mm-hmm. and i was like this is a sign but then it was the exact same sentiment that made me decide kind of not to do it. Cause I was like, well, they just did it. And I just watched that. So all I'm going to do is parrot all of their t- great talking points. Yeah. And I'm just going to pull a mics to class for fucking two hours. So that's yeah. not going to do anybody any good. And I mean, I haven't, I haven't watched uh, red letter media in a while. Mm. Um, I, <laughs> yeah, I don't know why I go through phases at the beginning yeah. of the pandemic. I had not watched it for a while. So I just sat down and I watched like, I mean, I was uh, single and alone every day, so I just like would just watch it. Compl- I think that's kind of how that show is meant to <laughs> yeah. be digested, yeah. and I just kind of like watched it all in a heartbeat, and then I stopped again because there's a lot of content, and they put out a lot of content, which is really mm-hmm. great. Um, mm-hmm. But then I also found doing my show, I got to watch what episodes I'm doing based on what podcast i'm listening to because yeah you're right you get you start parroting what other shows say about different pod like different movies and Mm -hmm. your opinions kind of get a little uh murky at times and like i'd listen to the action boys talk about enemy mine and so i'd never seen it before and i didn't know what happens in the movie and then i listened to that and holy Christ, oh, that movie get wild. sounds fucking wild. <laughs> things get crazy. Uh, so, like, I do want to see it, but I feel like that's almost like we should be in person to talk about it as well. It should maybe just be a straight up commentary, kind of like we did the, the Mario Brothers thing. I think yeah. it's that caliber of episode. It needs yeah. to be that. <laughs> I've only done one commentary on this show, which is uh, the um, Wolverine Origins. Right, right. But always down to maybe do another one because mm-hmm. that one is quite good and um it, it was can be a- pretty fun and like like we, it's been built up for so long on this show like we're gonna come in with like notebooks full of shit to say 
exactly. And uh, it'll it'll be a fun time. Exactly. So um, speaking of fun times. <laughs> so yeah. So well, before we get into the movie that we're going to talk about today, uh, uh, what have you uh, been watching lately? What if, what is uh? Um, well, not to put too much of a segue on it, but uh, yeah, I did finish questions. watching uh, Only Murders in the Building, which was kind of what put me on a bit of a Steve Martin kick, which is why I wanted to talk about this movie. Um, so this and, uh, only murders in the building he created that yeah, yeah with martin short yeah yeah and uh you know the i mean the pitch is bonkers, selena right? gomez like, selena that's... gomez is in it and you see the poster come out and you're like what in the hell is going on here you've yeah. got these two masters of comedy and a, you know she's just a charismatic she's lovely to watch have you ever watched her cooking show on like amazon prime i have not it seems right, very privileged and, it's, and like very rich. <laughs> it, it's insanely privileged, but yeah. it's also she's got so much charisma and she's so adorable because she's basically just never cooked. But she's got this five star uh, Spanish dream kitchen in her mansion that of she's just she like, does. well, I never I've never been in this room and I never use anything. So why don't I call a bunch of famous chefs to teach me how to cook food? Yeah. But it's basically all in real time. And you just watch her bumble through it. Uh, and it, it's it's kind of a weird contrast because you've got this like famous master French chef teaching you how to make eggs. It's like the dream cooking lesson. And he's in a one bedroom apartment with a screaming baby <laughs> and a tiny oven and stuff. But in a way that kind of teaches you that you don't need expensive, crazy shit to do this food. He's about mm-hmm. to make a Michelin star meal out of an oven smaller than the one I have. And she's got everything in the world in front of her and she's going to make garbage eggs and so there's a weird like the contrast there is is super fun to watch actually mm. and they're only half hour episodes so you're not sitting there for an hour watching them just talk about bullshit it's all about the cooking mostly well that's good it's that's great i i would recommend that for sure um and then based off the strength of that rachel and i watched that a bit during the pandemic we we're like okay we gotta watch this steve martin martin short thing yeah uh and it was great she's great in it they're obviously fantastic in it the writing is sharp um it's like it's like a really good murder mystery every every episode just introduces more and more and more and you get all twisted up it's great oh well, there you go and it's like kind of a slapsticky comedy like he does sort of thing or? um no it's pretty subdued um oh, they say fuck a lot it's mostly just conversational comedy oh um, okay it's kind of a departure martin short still being very martin short-esque yeah. but there's a lot of tragedy and all the characters pass so it gets very somber at points um and Shit. they never they never kind of use that emotionality to then make like a parody joke line or anything. Okay. The comedy is very organic. I really, I would recommend you check it out, even if it looked weird to you, which it did look weird. So, well, it just seemed like here's these two old comedy actors and one young hot actress that are like, okay, we're all gonna like it, this will draw in the youths. <laughs> it just felt like, yeah, it was like old people trying to be hip, like kind of thing, but, uh, but again, that's just maybe how it was marketed to me and how I interpreted it. And I don't know. I have a hard time watching these old comedians nowadays trying to do some of the same stuff that they used to do. So if it, mm-hmm. if it is them adapting to kind of a modern take on things and not just making jokes about how old they are. Yeah. All right. I'm more no, interested there's... in that. There's a there's a decided lack of like boomer humor in it. It's it's Good. very much, um, you know, it, it's not that old guys who don't you know belong in this world making inappropriate jokes, you know, Milton Berle style and and trying to you know get away with weird humor and being like you guys just don't understand. It's nothing like that. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> no, that's good. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I've uh, oh well, yeah, it sounds like a good show. And I know it's like seg- mm-hmm. you segued into this. I mean, you got like uh, Stranger Things season four coming out. Ghostbusters yep. is finally being released. Yep. Um, I've been watching uh, over the past, uh, this last week anyway, all of season one of um, uh, Attack on Titan. <laughs> so mm. I've been getting really into into that. I, I really enjoy it. And I think that it's kind of a hot take but damn it's a good show and <laughs> more people should watch it and I hotter think than hell take from bryce logan here. well here's the thing is like most anime based on mangas or any kind of comic book adaptation uh and you'll have you you know some stuff about this 
um, based on your job and just your experience and what you've seen is they tend to like gloss over a lot of stuff um, or they kind of just try to like some good adaptations like, well, we can't fit everything. You know, we can't do a Snyder's Watchmen where we're going to make it three and a half hours and we're going to put in every little detail, which I personally sometimes really like. Um, It's not something I'm going to be watching through like and i like that snyder's watchman has a completely different ending you know and like it just mm-hmm. it takes liberties in the weirdest places yeah. um which i think a good adaptation does now i've never read the manga manga of this but the fact that this season every it's almost like there's gigantic sections so it'll be like the first five episodes are all about one thing and mm. it's just going and going and like there'll be one battle that's seven parts so then you're watching it and you're just like i have nothing will happen in this episode no no action to the point where it's just like people are just getting constantly pumped up and constantly like i need to do this and the stakes are constantly being mangled and heightened and lowered and all over this place and then it's like and then it'll just end on that episode and then you have to start (laughs) the next one it's designed to be binge but then i'm if you take a step back and i'm watching it and i'm like this must be like reading one whole book of the manga for one whole season because you're mm. just kind of like you're slowly doling out. And I think of comic book adaptations that are very long, like The Walking Dead. You know, it took, uh, you know, when the show started, they were just getting to a part where the show just kind of passed now, I guess. So it's kind of like this weird thing where they really. The Walking Dead is another one where they kind of took their time and their liberties when they needed to. And I think that those are kind of the main reasons why these adaptations kind of work. But I'm just kind of flabbergasted that I'm watching a show about kids that kill gigantic giants. And uh, they have the the humor that, you know, anime can have. But then also Mm -hmm. it is just like the most harrowing, long, stretched out monologues about honor (laughs) <laughs> and not <laughs> and not giving up on your friends and your family and having a purpose in life and like so i'm just sitting here in Jesus. my underwear <laughs> watching this shit eating mcdonald's being like yeah purpose in life <laughs> it's, 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 it's this weird juxtaposition my brain's getting all scrambled but mm-hmm. it's really enjoyable and i highly mm-hmm. recommend it and the animation's beautiful and the mm-hmm. fact that the first season came out and then the second season the first season came out in 2013 and Bran was mentioning that she watched it when it came out because she knew about it before it got popular. Then the second season came out in 2017. So they had to wait four years for the second season. Jeez. And then, and then after, because by then it's now at the cons and everything. So it's like, shit, we got to put a, an ep- a season out every, every year. Uh, I was going to say, I didn't know that the first season was almost 10 years old because I didn't start hearing about it until about 2017 or something. Exactly. That's, when, that's it started, when it really exploded. Yeah. The first season uh, ended in, I mean, the airing dates are all kind of fucked up here, but it Mm. looks like 2013, September 29th, 2013. So it's kind of like, yeah, it's eight years old and it's wild. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So it's just like, and yeah, it seems like it's been going on forever and I don't know. I still haven't watched Squid Game if anyone cares and I do not intend to watch it anytime soon no (laughs) it it Uh, just seems like it's setting me up for disappointment already when 50 people tell me it's so good you gotta watch it i'm like is it good is it good or is netflix just telling everybody it's good you know when you put out a news release saying this is our most watched show ever and then 50 million more people start watching it it's like was it actually the most popular show ever when you said that Nobody a, has access to these numbers. <laughs> exactly. No one what has an access ad to the numbers. <laughs> and also, it is very much like, I don't, the fact that people are getting so up about this one Korean drama, horror series, thriller, when there's so many other ones out there in mm-hmm. so many other countries that have so many good television shows that, that are <laughs> that have subtitles, and people are just obsessed with this one because of when it came out. And I haven't talked to anyone that's watched it all the way through that actually watched it with the actual language and the subtitles. Yeah. And so what I've heard is that it drastically changes changes the story yeah. if you watch it with the English dubbing. And so like almost anything 
a foreign language, you you have to watch it in that way it was originally written and produced because that is the way the storyteller was meaning the story to be told. When, so I can't trust I... any people I know that have reviewed <laughs> it because they're all like, they're just like, they don't, they haven't watched a lot of that kind of stuff, mm-hmm. which is fine. I'm happy to get people into it. Yeah. But then if they're just saying like, it's so great and stuff and it's like, well, I feel like I've already guessed the show based on the images and my past yeah. experience with thrillers. Mm-hmm. And like me and Brianna are like, how it can't be good. Like no. at this point, I'm so <laughs> against it being good that I'm going to watch it. And if it is good, I'm going to be so just silent. Blow your mind. I'm just going to be so fucking quiet and just be like, no, it's good. But yeah, if I it's watched not the game. Good, it was all right. Oh, man. It's not good. I'm going to get mad. Did you? Yeah. Did you watch it? Uh, I haven't watched it yet. No, no um, right. I was going to make a point as well about your, your subtitles. Netflix is notoriously awful yeah. for their dubs. Uh, and even their subtitles. There's something very important to note when you're watching anything that uh, has been transcribed in that way. And that's somebody's interpretation of what the fucking words mean. Mm-hmm. Like if you remember the last episode of uh, Evangelion, there was an outcry because the subtitles were wrong and presented the story at some points with a different feeling than if you were actually a native speaker. Is that when he comes in his hand? That's when he comes in his hand. Really? Yeah. They, they changed the, they changed the line. So if you, He's, the original is I'm so fucked up. Yeah. And then the, the subtitles said, I'm the lowest of the low, <laughs> which doesn't seem like that big a deal, but <laughs> no. how fucking like you're sterilizing the language and you're changing yes. basically what he's saying. Yeah. Um, R- Rachel and I kind of, um, we were watching this really stupid um, game show thing the other day on Netflix. I think it's some Spanish thing where they're tricking a group of people into thinking they're not yet on a reality show and that's the reality show. So they think that they're in, hold on. so they think they're in the selection process, but oh, they've okay. been told the selection process will take six weeks and they live at this little complex thing. And they've got like crew running around, like fake building new sets and stuff. being like, this will all look like this. This will all be ready soon. And the whole hook is, and the host just keeps sitting here saying this, like it'll cut to her. And she's like, and they don't know they're being filmed. What you're seeing is real. Like over and over and over and over again, they do that. Okay. But we, what we noticed is uh, Rachel always has subtitles on when we're watching stuff, which is, which is actually great because sometimes when movies have a bad sound mix, you don't hear what the fuck people are saying. Yep. But we were also listening to the English dub. And the English dub at no point matched up to what the subtitles said. Oh. At no point. So like literally like somebody would say like, oh, fuck this. And the subtitle would see like, this is shit. Like huh. that much of a disconnect. And so it's just like, even with the dub off and the subtitles on, you don't know if that's actually what the people are saying, unless you speak the fucking language. Huh. Netflix is awful for that. Just terrible. Yeah. No, that's a really good point. It's yeah. good to know. Mm-hmm. I think that it is a... um I mean, yeah, I, I now watch stuff with subtitles on and this kind of one that leads this leads me into what I wanted to talk about with you, too, before we get into the movie, before I do my ad read, before we actually talk about the movie, um, <clears throat> because this is the eighth year anniversary of my show. You know, tangents are welcome. There doesn't need to be any concise, you know, you know, not, it's not like that's bitten me in the ass before when I've been trying to get that <laughs> time or anything. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but um, I wanted to talk about dune because we both saw dune in theaters mm-hmm. and i wanted to ask you i know you had a problem with the sound mix i, I did yeah. but i was wondering halfway through it i was like there was so many subtitles in the in the movie when it came to like either a language different being spoken or the um hand gestures like mm-hmm. sign language mm-hmm. um did you miss having subtitles on the screen when you were watching Dune a little bit in theaters? Uh, yeah. It's Are we funny. kind of broken when you, now? When you oh. watch them all the time, yeah. it, it's sort of a crutch that you didn't know you needed until there's a movie with loud pounding music over somebody whispering and you cannot fucking hear what they're saying. Yeah. And it's like, I found myself going like, well, I, I'm, I'm lucky because my mom made me watch foreign films when I was younger. So I had to get used to reading subtitles. Um, we were never allowed dubs. Um, so for me, watching a movie with subtitles is kind of easy. 
because it's very much just like, oh, that's just what you do. You just you glance and you can read really quickly kind of thing. Mm-hmm. You catch it all. Mm-hmm. But uh, I find it so I don't find it that much of a problem anymore. The only time mm-hmm. I ever find subtitles a problem is when I'm watching a comedy because I find it'll give away the joke. Yeah, I find that as well. I don't like having them on, especially sitcoms, because then you just do yeah. the punchline and then all the nuance and timing is gone. Yeah, 100 percent. So but yeah, no, I just remember watching Dune and just being like, hmm. I kind of like the moments when they're doing sign language and stuff mm. because the subtitles <laughs> came up on the screen. But while we're on the topic of Dune, suckered you into it. What did you think of Dune? Um, I really, really liked it. I'm really excited uh, for part two. Obviously, the direction was great. Visuals are amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, my problems were were small. I had issues with um, the passing of time and how that was portrayed. I got confused as to the timeline a lot of the time, and I felt like certain things were rushed. But that's just going to happen in a two and a half hour runtime for a book this dense. Um, yeah. And like I said, the sound mix, it's that Christopher Nolan, Hans Zimmer, play the music as loud as you can over top of everything and try to evoke a feeling rather than letting stuff happen. Yeah. Um, and I watched a really good YouTube video the other day breaking down how awesome the soundtrack is. But he had the same critique as me where it's like when you have these slow kind of broken down scenes where you're doing some drama like between characters, maybe shut the fuck up and let that happen. Let it breathe. Turn off the score for a second. <laughs> let us yeah. breathe. So that was maybe my biggest problem. And I mean, it's one of the things people are praising to the moon is the the soundtrack, but I found it to be a bit overblown. I haven't listened to the score. I'm a little over Zimmer. Um, he is doing too much work right now. Yeah. Like the last the score that I he was... did, the last score that he did that I really, really liked was the um, interstellar score because it was, oh, was fantastic, more subtle and it wasn't just over and over and over again and digital and everything. Like I like the 2049 score, but at the same time, it's kind of like, mm-hmm. I don't know. Uh, was it Dune? There was a movie I was watching recently that Zimmer did. And I was, there were all these points where like the, I, I, I'm just going to say it like heist points, but like, you know, moments where people are sneaking. Oh, it was, uh, it was Bond when I went to see Bond and Hans Zimmer did a score for that as well. Oh. And every time Bond is doing Bond shit and like he's sneaking around in a facility, I'm like, this is just the Dark Knight soundtrack. It's just uh-huh. little violent. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. I'm like, come on, guys, stop using Hans Zimmer for everything or everything's just going to start sounding the same. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I like, I, I do love the, the Dark Knight score. It's so fucking well, good. Um, yeah. How is Bond? Uh, I really liked it. Right. Um, there were some some points where I thought it was kind of turning into a bit of a Mission Impossible movie, if that makes sense, in like the second act and beyond. I'm not going to ruin anything for you. I mean, it um, makes sense in making me want to see it more if it's more of a Mission <laughs> Impossible movie. Yeah. No series You'll... has done more for me <laughs> wanting to watch something more than James Bond than Mission Impossible <laughs> becoming what Mission Impossible has become. Yeah. When you, when you see it, you'll know what I'm talking about. Maybe we can talk about it after you see it. But it, yeah. was, it was a little bit off-putting to me. Um, and it, it's kind of like, is like our action movies becoming this singularity of sameness? I is mean, maybe a problem we need to talk about? We got but, the Judd Apatow comedies making that yeah. all the same, you know? So you never know, probably. I mean, speaking of which, Booksmart was great. I loved yeah. it. Watched it a couple weeks ago. <laughs> Lovely yeah. movie. Hilarious. There you go. Booksmart comes up on the podcast again. No, it's a good It's a good show. It's a good movie. I watched it around the beginning of the pandemic again with Brienne, and she really liked it, too. And it's a good movie. It's fun. Mm-hmm. Um the episode today is sponsored by brewk.ca. So let me tell you what that is. What it is, is, yeah, flowers are nice, but let's face it, they're not always appropriate. Sometimes flowers just don't work. Uh, sometimes a cold one on the patio is way more preferred than a handful of daisies. That's where Brew K comes in. They are tastefully curated collections featuring craft beer and superior local goods. Um, Rest assured that buying a bruquet is simple, but the gesture is grand. So what it is, folks, it's, you know, take a bouquet, throw the flowers away, replace it with delicious craft beer from the lower mainland in Calgary. And then, you know, the foliage that goes around the flowers to like buff up the flowers to make them look bigger and prettier. Uh, You know, you throw that foliage away because now that's just around a bunch of beer and you replace it with different tastefully curated treats like um, laid back snacks. They are now part of Brew K 
So laid back snacks, wasabi cracker mix, uh, maple praline almonds. Fuck, those sound good. Sriracha cashews. And then just jerky still there with their honey garlic beef jerky and roasted jalapeno beef jerky. And then you got it. Zazu bean chocolate bars with sea salt and almond, pomegranate and hazelnut and mint and cacao. Mint and chocolate. Cacao chocolate. Cacao. Such a fun word. I always think of the Portlandia sketch where they use that as like the their safe word for sex. Cacao. Um, <laughs> but you get it in a nice burlap sack. Uh, it is tastefully curated. It's very nice. And you can go to the website and uh, you can uh, go, go to the website. Uh, the, it is brewk.ca. Um, let's see here. Yeah, brewk.ca. So B R E W Q U E C Q U E T dot C A. Uh, you can go on there and use the promo code Let's Watch Pod to get $5 off your order today. Um, now, delivery, uh, these things are delivered directly to the people you want to buy them for. Okay, so it's free in uh, a majority of places in the lower mainland. Let me just say in Vancouver, it's free delivery within Vancouver, Burnaby, North Vancouver, West Vancouver, New Westminster, Richmond, Horseshoe Bay, Lions Bay, Britannia Beach, Squamish, Breckendale, and Whistler. Anywhere outside that, if you just email hello at brewk.ca, uh, you can talk to them about how much uh, the, the delivery fee is going to be a little bit extra. Maybe it's under five bucks, in which case you're still saving money on the thing and you're getting free delivery. Still, if you're in Calgary, uh, the delivery is free anywhere within Calgary city limits. Uh, they hand delivery within the city limits and uh, anywhere outside that. So like Aradine, Chestermeyer, Cochrane, D. Winston, Okotoks, and Rocky View, there's an additional courier fee. But you can still use the promo code there. Let's watch pod to get $5 off your order today. Go to the website, support people that are local. And, you know, uh, 85% of their products are local and 95% of them are Canadian. So if you have any questions, you can email them at hello at brewk.ca or call and text, uh, call or text 778-995-5063 for any questions or if you want to place an order and you don't want to use online. But remember to use the promo code Let's Watch Pod to get $5 off your order. So, yes. Now let us talk about the movie that you have picked which is the title of this episode because now we are 30 minutes into talking. So it's the perfect time to, <laughs> to start <interject>. talking, <laughs> start talking about the movie, about the movie, um, the movie that you wanted to talk about today, which I was very surprised and I did not know what the fuck it was, uh, was LA story uh, by, with Steve Martin directed by Mick Jackson and written by Steve Martin. Uh, the movie is with the help of a talking freeway billboard, a wacky weatherman tries to win the heart of an English newspaper reporter who is struggling to make sense of the strange world of early 1990s Los Angeles. Uh, the movie stars, I'm just going to do say stars, Steve Martin, Victoria Tennant, Richard E. Grant, Sarah Jessica Parker, and Mary Lou Henner. Um, it came out in 1991. Um, it made... 28.9 at the box office and it's currently got a 93 percent on rotten tomatoes michael why the hell did you want to watch la story <laughs> why'd you pick this uh well it's on a bit of a steve martin mindset and kick since the uh the other the show we were talking about earlier was was done um and then i saw an article somewhere just talking about all steve martin's old movies and how it's the perfect time to go back and rewatch. um and this one was top of the list really yeah because yeah, i'd never heard about this movie before had you heard about it before you read this um i had heard it i knew he was in it and i knew he wrote it but i had no idea what it was about yeah. um and it turns out it's kind of about a lot which is great <laughs> yeah it's a very weird little interesting movie i always saw the cover la story and I always, I never really rec never saw his name up at the top of it. Cause the cover to me is bringing back a lot of like VHS mm -hmm. going to the video store vibes. <laughs> but yeah, I had no idea what this movie was. And uh, I mean, turns out it's actually kind of adorable and very nice. And uh, what did you think of it? 
I thought it was fantastic. Um, I actually watched it again last night. You did watch it a second time. I watched okay. it a second time with Rachel and she liked it as well. And it's such a, it's in such a unique place, like just for so many reasons. Um, one of the greatest parts about it, I think, is just the time period. So it came out in 91, which is when the 90s still thought they were the 80s in a lot of ways. And people didn't know what the 90s was. Yeah. So you've got this weird mix of 90s influence starting to mix in and people clearly are clinging to the 80s a little bit. And Sarah Jessica Parker's character is such a caught in between head in the clouds person. She's so great in the movie. Well, she, and, yeah, she's very much the she's the 90s darling. Like she's mm-hmm. the new generation and it's Steve Martin going up against the new generation and seeing mm-hmm. how how that's going to be. It's also it's always so tough to tell how old he is when you see him in a movie because he's had that silver hair. I mean, I'm assuming since the womb, and uh, he, he's forty. He was forty six when this was made. Wow. Um, wow. Which I thought that their kind of romance was going to be maybe a little gross, especially by today's standards, because she was only twenty six. But it's not. It's very cute and it's very, uh, very mutual. Well, subdued. So when they do, they do a good job of not overly sexualizing her yeah. in a lot of ways, but also giving her agency in the yeah. in the sense that she's just she's a child, and they and he views her as a child at times and stuff. But at the same time, it's I don't know, it's uh, she's it's her also, own person, and yeah. exactly, and it's also not the focal point of the movie. It's yeah, just sort I mean, of like unlike a side some of these posters, them both. Oh yeah, go ahead. unlike some of these posters, might have you believe that mm-hmm. it, it, it's not the focal point of the movie. Like I saw one of them, and Sarah Jessica Parker is on the title, and she's and she's got the it's Victoria Tennant, it's Steve Martin, Victoria Tennant, Richard E. Grant, Mary Lou Henner, and Sarah Jessica Parker are the leads. But it's like mm-hmm. I don't know. I wouldn't consider her a lead. <laughs> you know, I, I <laughs> consider a very big supporting character. Mm-hmm. Um, Anyway, go on. Um, no, I was good. Uh, that was basically just kind of my point. She just does such a really good job of lifting up the story for her end and um, playing a really good supporting role. Yeah. I mean, so the movie, I, I liked it as well. I only watched it once. Um, I thought it was very, uh, very strange and very wacky. <laughs> uh, but at the same time, all I got were like, this is Steve Martin trying to do a Woody Allen movie. Um, Yeah. And it very much down to like the jazz and like the, um, some of the gags and about how he's always kind of in on the joke, but explaining the joke, but also doesn't get the joke in a lot of scenes. And it's Mm -hmm. kind of like, he's, he's playing like a Woody Allen character, which I think Mm -hmm. is great because, you know, I haven't watched a Woody Allen movie in a long time for obvious reasons. And Mm -hmm. uh, I miss, I miss them. A little bit because I do enjoy those films but um yeah he he's this very interesting it, it's this very interesting story about a guy who's in a very kind of shitty everything is kind of stagnant in his life mm-hmm. right and it's very much like a classic kind of romance movie of boy meets girl and then they eventually fall in love with each other and everything but it, it's got all these really weird idiosyncrasies about LA in the nineties and just North America in the nineties, I guess. I I honestly still can't tell whether he actually likes LA or whether he hates LA. (laughs) Yeah. And there's uh, cause the, all the jokes are at the expense of that kind of bohemian free spirited culture down there and everything. But also not the bohemian side, the very like, this is what you do and this is and, and poking fun at how stupid all of yeah. the stuff that people do there is yeah. like but in to- a way where he he knows he's a participant and so it's like that's why i can't tell if he really hates it he just wants to draw attention to how ludicrous it is all these things that these people are doing down there yeah like yeah there's so many jokes like i bet rewatching it was great Oh, because man. the amount of jokes in the in the dinner scene in the lunch scene alone and oh leading up to the lunch scene um uh like when <laughs> the the coffee order at the end how they're all ordering decaf in different decaf <laughs> ways and then Steve Martin <laughs> orders a twist of lemon with his and then they all have to get a twist of lemon as well That's so um, good. <clears throat> yeah how when they go to the fancy restaurant um they Lydia. they get offered floss 
and (laughs) there's choices of diet regular regular, diet which you Uh, which is never and that's the other thing is none of the jokes are explained and like when he's like uh when he's like grab the gun out of the (laughs) <laughs> do bullets go bad no it's not like milk just load the gun <laughs> yeah and then he's but why are they loading guns and they're shooting at each other it's because traffic on the freeway is in in la driving like road yeah. rage is such a catastrophic thing there that it's yeah. just like oh well we just this is the time of year when it goes to hell so everyone have their gun ready sort of thing there's there's a delicate <laughs> balance as well which is I mean, I, I can't even say it's hard to do. It's impossible to do. So it, like the gun battle is about as close to crazy full on parody as they get like super, almost, almost like airplane style. That but in Shakespeare, a way, being Shakespeare being in buried LA. in LA. <laughs> There's this great quote I love from William Shakespeare, longtime resident of LA. <laughs> like what? So good. Um, and it, it, there's a, there's a, uh, they subdue it just to the point of being that kind of crazy parody, but yeah. there's an earnestness to it that keeps it held back every time. And it's this perfect balance mm-hmm. of ridiculous, wacky, magical realism, crazy shit. Like his commute to work in the opening scene where he's just like, Oh, onto the curb. I go through this guy's backyard. Hey, Harry, how's it going? Yeah. All the way to work is just great. It's hilarious. Um, and and sweet in a way Mm -hmm. um it's just and i mean that's just steve martin like he has this effortless um uh there's a genuineness to like how much he just lovingly writes about all these even ridiculous things he finds stupid like you can't help but fall in love with it it's just great yeah there's like this there's innocence to his humor but it's Mm -hmm. also very adult and like um Oh, there was oh, very so, adult. Yeah, there were so many jokes. Uh, like the, when I mean, my favorite, my favorite one at the lunch is when what's his name, um, Larry Waller, uh, who's in the neck brace. They they're waiting for Sarah to get there, and he's the loudest voice there. And he's like, "I, I don't know why we don't just shoot everybody who talks loud in a restaurant. Just shoot them in the street like a dog." And, and then he's like, like well, "Ow, my neck. no, they're not. Yeah, ow, my yeah. neck." I like when the uh, Sam McMurray, he's the guy who's like, who does the movie reviews. And he was like, I was going to give it like a five to an eight or like an eight to a nine. And then I saw that the executive producer had a really good parking spot out front. So I went on screen and gave him a three. <laughs> it's just like fucking. But then like, there's like the earthquake where everything's moving around. I, I, I give it a four. <laughs> like there, there's so many, uh, there so there's there's a lot of bits about like um i mean there's a lot of like infidelity and cheating and 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 stuff but that's also something that happens in this universe and and Mm -hmm. in this world and especially in that time period during the 80s and 90s and Mm -hmm. during in hollywood you know Mm -hmm. um everyone's trying to make it big and but they uh the when he finds out that she's sleeping with kevin pollack or his agent and he's like, how long has this been going on? She's like, three years. And he's like, this has been happening since the 80s. 80s? <laughs> and this is how I find out? You tell me? <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's the line. And this is how I find out? You tell me? Oh, um, man. Yeah. I, think I mean, the, the, yeah. yeah, like all of these jokes and basically the entire movie is just this big in joke about Hollywood and L.A. and both the realness and fakeness of all the characters, like everything both is and isn't. And yes. uh, it just never stops. Everything is a joke. And Every scene is a joke. It's fantastic. And the movie has a tendency to allow tangents to happen, which I think are very important in comedies like this. Oh, yeah. Because it, it, I think it kind of, if you were to cut out all the fat, so all the like the overblown jokes, you would have a very short film because it's a very straightforward guy. Mm-hmm. Like I said, guy meets girl. He He's given the ability to like show her around LA because she's not from around here. Mm-hmm. I like the line. He's like, "Hey, first stop six blocks away." She's like, "Why don't we walk?" He's like, "Walk <laughs> in um, L.A." Uh, and then you know, there's they go to art galleries and there's Shakespeare quoting in the park and like all this fucking Woody Allen romantic shit. And then uh, down to like she's on a plane and then he changes the weather and she comes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, it's all this shit and there's a talking book. It's just ridiculous. Mm-hmm. But then the movie has moments like when he's going to make a reservation for <laughs> the fancy new French <laughs> restaurant. 
and they just laugh at him, which I've heard in movies before. I was like, okay, well, yeah, yeah this. And then he has to go to the bank of the First Reich, so it's like <laughs> it's making a point that like LA's been built on Nazi money, and then uh, Patrick Stewart, who is the owner and the maitre d of this restaurant, is basically checking his credit score to see. If yeah. he's able to even get a table there <laughs> with, <laughs> with numbers like this, do you think you can have the duck? <laughs> he can have the chicken. <laughs> he can have the chicken. And then they have the, you know, the Chevy Chase, uh, mm-hmm. like, um, cameo when he's coming in. He's like, can I have a better table? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Fair. <Yeah. laughs> um, Carrie yeah. Elwes powdering his nose in the corner. <laughs> yes, Carrie Elwes. Um, what's his name? Uh, oh, should we go over all the cameos? Yeah, quick? there's a lot of cameos. There's, there's an insane scenery. amount of cameos, which itself is an in joke because everybody hates them and then they're in every fucking movie. Yeah. I'm fairly confident, I'm probably wrong, that Chris Elliott is the guy who robs him at the ATM, which is another fantastic joke. I'll have to take a look here. Um, John he, Lithgow was in a deleted scene. Deleted scene, yeah. Paula Abdul was a roller skater in front of Taylor mm-hmm. the pup. And I'm pretty um, sure Kim Cattrall was one as well. Chevy Chase, Woody Harrelson's in it. Mm-hmm. Rick Moranis, so Terry good. Jones does a voice on the, he, he plays Sarah's mother. <laughs> That's right. Um, oh, hello. <laughs> so ridiculous. Uh, d- 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 that's, that's kind of it. I don't see, <clears throat> I don't see. Um, her on the list here yeah uh what's her name the model uh iman was one of the lunch guests yes yes um larry miller francis fisher um patrick stewart of course kevin pollack um it's it's weird to see a a young richard e grant i always forget how how he was in so many like 80s and 90s kind of quote-unquote normal movies but then Mm -hmm. he did all these really kind of like he got famous for with nail and I, and he got an Oscar nomination for can you forever forgive me? Mm-hmm. And yeah, I know, but that guy fucking works and works and works over and over and over again. Yeah. Oh yeah. His first one of his, his first feature film was with nail and I, Oh wow. which is a phenomenal movie, mm-hmm. which I don't know if you haven't seen, everyone should see. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway. Yeah, the cameos are great and they're all over the place and they're they're constantly like people are just popping up and having bit jokes. There's a lot of like machine gun humor in this in this movie, mm-hmm. which I think is a lot of fun. And it it leads itself to like I didn't realize that um that this movie existed and was this good. <laughs> and so like the director, I was looking at it, he worked he's still alive and he's He's worked up to. He just had a movie, Denial. That movie, Denial, that came out in 2016. Oh, really? Uh, do you remember that one? With um, um, I vaguely recall. Uh, it's got uh, Timothy Spall and Rachel Wise, and it's basically about acclaimed writer and historian Deborah E. Lipstadt uh, must battle for historical truth to prove the ho- to prove the Holocaust actually occurred. Oh dear God! Uh, when uh, David Irving, an, a renowned denier, sues her for libel. So like uh, because she basically says he's he's being crazy. Full of shit. <laughs> yeah. And then so she has to go and try. It's it's a really good movie. I watched it. Um, it was in my like, I'll watch anything that comes out days. But this director, um, he did his first like feature film that wasn't a TV movie was this uh Chattahoochee. 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 Mm. Have you heard of it? No. <laughs> Chattahoochee, let me tell you, because I watched the trailer before you got on Zoom. In 1955, Florida, a Korean vet has a breakdown and is incarcerated in a maximum security mental health prison where patients are abused. It stars Gary Oldman, Dennis Hopper, Francis McDormand, Pamela Reed, Ned Beatty, and M. Emmett Walsh. What the hell? Yeah, and the trailer looks good. And then you see uh, Gary Oldman has this gigantic fake beard through most of it. And it's <laughs> like, oh, this probably wasn't a good movie. But he went and did that. And then he did LA Story. Yeah. <laughs> and then he did The Bodyguard. That was right. his big claim to fame. And big then uh, Clean Slate. He did the movie Volcano, which we all know and love. <laughs> uh, and then... Some movie called The First 20 Million is Always the Hardest, which uh, was written by um, John Favreau. Oh, wow. 
Yeah. Back and then, in the maid days. Then he did the uh the TV movie Live from Baghdad, which was a movie that I vividly With remember Michael watching Keaton. a lot when I was a kid. Yeah. yeah. And that then, was an early HBO movie, wasn't it? I think it was, yeah. And then yeah, he did the Temple Grandian TV movie. Um that got a lot of attention. Yeah. And with Claire Danes and mm-hmm. that's it. Uh, Memory Keeper's Daughter, a lot of TV movies, huh. but um, yeah, it's just kind of this weird LA story is the only really straight up comedy in the middle of all of it. Mm-hmm. And I wonder, like, did you get the feeling that like Steve Martin was kind of directing this himself too? Oh, well, it's so it's obviously like everything in the movie is stuff that Steve Martin is interested in. And the writing is so, um, it's all everything that he does in the movie is from position of love. So it's clearly a passion project for him. Mm -hmm. Uh, Like he's obsessed with Shakespeare. Um, I read up a little bit on how much he loves um, mid-century paintings. Mm. He's actually an art curator in his, like guess whatever spare time, a big rich 80 year old white guy has (laughs) Um, like, he's been selling paintings for tens of millions of dollars for the last 10 years that he's had since the sixties and stuff. So that scene where he goes off like the obvious joke, but really well done about the big, blah red painting yeah. and how he finds <laughs> anyways so he clearly loves all of these things so i get the feeling for a lot of the um kind of talking head just you know kind of like the it's almost like the stage play style of like the um like the words on the script mm-hmm. i generally get the feeling that steve probably had a bit of a hand in me like no 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 it has to be like this or oh no no this is how we would do it if it was done the way i'd like it th- i wrote it on the page i get the feeling with that but there's also a lot of kind of almost experimental editing I found in, in mm. some of it that mm. was clearly like the, the direction was great. Like I thought a lot of the like skyline shots of LA and stuff were really cool. Um, and whenever there's like an anxiety inducing thing and some fast cuts and weird shit happens, I think that was probably a bit more of an influence from Mick than it was from, from Martin. Yeah. I think the camera movements and everything, like the overall look of the movie was very much Mick. Um mm. But yeah, the the editing, I feel like this movie kind of lived and kind of became what it was in the editing room because it feels like very much a very long sketch that yeah. he cut together to be like he's in every scene mm-hmm. pretty much. And he's in the only scenes that he's not in are when um, Victoria Tennant and Richard E. Grant are together. But then he ends up being basically in the background <laughs> of those scenes anyway, eventually. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um but yeah, I think it's interesting too, because he's like his history of being, he hasn't really directed too much. Um, he's only directed three episodes of TV and he stopped after 86. So he very oh, wow. much just didn't direct anything, but his, his writing is that's, that's, he's kind of a prolific writer. Like mm-hmm. he, he very much like, and you, did you ever see the movie shop girl? I didn't end up seeing it, no. But he wrote a book called Shop Girl, and then um, he adapted it into the screenplay, and he's in it. Right. Um, that is where you can tell he's got a very a big affinity for art mm-hmm. and everything. So it's like, oh, that's him flexing that knowledge. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like he'd be a really cool guy to interview. Like he just has had all these interests over the years, and then just pursued the shit out of them. I mean, and seems like a, an expert in the arts, honestly. I mean, I'd hope so. You know, mm-hmm. I'd hope that he he would like. He seems like he seems like <clears throat> we don't know how much of an ego he probably has. Oh, he we don't be know a how much complete motherfucker. <laughs> yeah, and like he he had a line in the what is it? I gotta go back to this. Uh, in the in the trivia for this. Well, okay, first off him and Victoria Tennant were married at the time when they shot this movie. Mm-hmm. And it makes sense. They have pretty good chemistry in the film. Mm-hmm. Um, they, uh, bu- 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 was it Steve Martin said, uh, when he was talking about, uh, in Morris Wayne's Walker's book, Steve Martin, the magic years, my mature film career started with all of me in 1984 and ends with LA story. So um, he kind of like, that's where he draws the line between all of, all of his films. So like all of me, did you see all of me? No. All of me is a dying millionaire has her soul transferred into a younger willing woman. 
However, something goes wrong and she finds herself in the lawyer in her lawyer's body together. <laughs> she, uh, together with the lawyer. So like three people are in one man. Oh my God. That seems very weird. Um, so that's, that's all of me. And then he, his, so that's where he says that like his, his, his serious film career kind of starts, which would be interesting to, to watch. Mm -hmm. And then he go, then he's got movers and shakers, three Amigo, three amigos, little shop of horrors, Roxanne, planes, trains, and automobiles, dirty rotten scandals, parenthood, my blue heaven, uh, and LA story. Honestly, an incredible run because then after that he's got father of the bride house sitter um leap of faith a simple twist of fate mixed nuts which is a very weird movie it's about him working at a suicide hotline Jeez. and <laughs> uh events focus around a crisis hotline business on one crazy night during the christmas holidays one uh, crazy <laughs> night one crazy night oh, um man. father of the bride part two so then it mm -hmm. just be, kind of becomes like i feel like if you were to interview him in this period of his life he would be kind of over it mm -hmm. but i feel like in that middle to earlier period i think it would have been i don't know i don't know i think he has probably a lot of insight and knowledge into he like his humor is something else like yeah. uh, like next to none like the jerk is one of the greatest films ever made i think it's absolutely hilarious and the fact that it came out in 1979 baffles me still mm. um and it can be watched today and just as enamored i can't believe i've never done it on the show it's such a good film um That's and i forgot why... that he wrote both pink panther movies yeah why? That's why he, it made so much sense for him to do the the reboot. Well, I mean, it didn't make sense ultimately because he's well, he wrote both old, reboots. But, yeah, yeah. So, the movie "L.A. Story." Is there anything that you didn't like about it? Oh, good question. Um, nothing really came to mind at the time. Like I really liked the pacing of the movie. I mean, it's a tight 90. I'm always down for a movie that keeps things moving. Yeah. Uh, I mean, as far as comedies go, you know, if they're Mike, if they're not making you laugh, you know, something is wrong. This movie made me laugh a lot. Yeah. Kept the joke jokes rolling. Yeah. Um, even when it slowed down for dramatic purposes. Um, I mean, Martin's performance just kind of carries things through um, and his chemistry with everybody is golden. Mm -hmm. Um. I don't know. I think if you wanted to critique anything, um, it goes a little formulaic for the rom-com thing. Mm -hmm. um, but again, that could be just part of a bigger joke as well, right? I mean, at the end of the day, usually if there's some kind of miracle or deus ex machina or something that makes you know the love work or whatever, it's not nearly this fantastical. So it's, it's an no. original way to do it. Yeah. Um, uh, oh, the, the Enya track was probably a little dated for those montages. <laughs> yeah. A little bit. Yeah. I forgot. I like yeah. I even tuned that out and I was like, I don't mm. fucking want to hear Enya. The only Enya <laughs> I like is in Lord of the Rings. Of the Rings. That's <laughs> my Enya. That's yeah, it. Girl with the dragon tattoo is a really good use of that song. True. <laughs> true. 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 Um, I guess. Yeah. Maybe that, maybe it, it can get formulaic at times. Um, but again, as long as you're keeping the jokes rolling and the pace up, I'm not, I'm not going to dock too many points for that. I mean, one thing I just noticed watching this time is like how much I kind of despised the nineties, but at the same time, it's like, I, I, I need to, I'm, I'm, we're both millennials. We are both born in the eighties, you and I, um, there is this section of our generation that has an affinity for the nineties or like mm -hmm. my sister who was born in 81, who's more of what the nineties kid would be. Mm -hmm. We're more of a two thousands kid because mm -hmm. we kind of came of age in the two thousands, in my opinion. Like, so I don't think we're at that resurgence of two thousands stuff yet, mm -hmm. but I feel like it's right around the corner and I think it's just bothering me. <laughs> like, I don't know. I don't know. There's something about the nineties that always kind of miffed me. And it, I think it's also just because I don't know why things got so bad after because everything was supposed to be very good in the 90s, like when it came to money and like 
the world was at this place where it was like we're gonna do better <laughs> and then technology kind of overtook everything and then technology is you know, like surge it's like i guess this is a part of me that misses uh the time before cell phones and everything and as yeah. i sit here on a computer zooming <laughs> calling with you and recording a podcast that's strictly for people with internet use um but like yeah there's a part of me that kind of that yeah. like a simpler time a simpler time you know it's different you know and i don't know what i i regret not living in that time period like i kind of wish i could have lived in that time period to at least experience that time period in that world of not having phones or having to have all this technology yeah um but that's well, a newer we sort of feeling did, but i mean this is obviously a bigger conversation but as they say youth is wasted on the young you know yeah we were too ain't young that, and stupid that to what they say yeah. the, what we had then Mm -hmm. um but you know i've I've been on record as saying the internet was a a mistake many many times (laughs) yeah people were not ready for the internet (laughs) i mean i don't know what the world what i would like what the world would be like without it now and that's what bothers me is because i feel like there was at one point in my life where i knew what that was like Mm -hmm. and then as quickly as i knew what it was like and as sure as i knew what that was like it's gone and that's what that's (laughs) and that's what i hate about it is like Oh, I lived that life at one point. I had that experience. I I had a life where I didn't have internet and um, didn't need it, you know, and then Mm -hmm. poof. Oh, nope. It's gone. All right. Fuck. Now cell phones and horror movies don't make sense. You know, like (laughs) that kind of stuff. Uh, It's it's very X2 is now an outdated movie. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) exactly. It's just like somebody just pick up a phone and call somebody you have. A cal- and it's like <laughs> you're, you're never gonna have what can you use a calculator to do this math perfect you're not always gonna have a calculator on you and it's like well yeah well, fuck you i have a calculator <laughs> i i i have a world inside my pocket at any yeah. given time um yeah is there anything else we want to talk about la story i think i'm surprised it didn't get nominated for some reason but i actually don't know what was coming out in the 91 was a strong year i mean that would have been 92 it would have been the 92 oscars 92 oscars let's so that's when jack palance won for city slickers is it not (laughs) uh yeah and that's the year jonathan demi won for sansa lambs yeah so strong ass motherfucking year you're not gonna shine with a comedy when all that stuff's going down I guess, but you know, that's when everybody know, started making thrillers. <laughs> Silence of the Lambs. That was the big, uh, the big win that year, the big yeah. five. And then, mm-hmm. yeah, Jack Palance for City Slickers, uh, Marcellus Rule for Fisher King, mm-hmm. Thelma and Louise, best screenplay written directly for the screen. I always forget Thelma and Louise was a 90s movie. It feels yeah. like an 80s movie every time. Yeah, well, that's the thing early 90s movies feel like 80s movies because they're starring people that came up in the (laughs) 80s but they're being made in the 90s so there's like this weird that's why 1999 and 2000 and 2001 are such weird movie years Mm -hmm. as well and then anything after 2001 is a complete mind fuck because it's post 9-11 so then the world is completely different when it comes to hollywood and north america Mm -hmm. and how things can be interpreted or what's said and how people are shown on screen and everything it's such a strange time Mm -hmm. Beauty and the Beast wins Best Original Score. Oh, of course. Best Original Song. Terminator yeah. 2 wins Best Sound and Best Sound Effects. Yeah. And Best Makeup. Beauty and the Beast is also the first animated feature nominated for Best Picture. JFK wins Best Film Editing and Best Cinematography. Is that the last time Oliver Stone won an Oscar? No. He, he didn't win an Oscar for that. Oh, I thought <laughs> he maybe edited it. Never mind. I mean, he could have. But I mean, I love that movie and mm. it has no right being loved <laughs> because it's a very, it's very much like a not, <laughs> it's not good. <laughs> it's very <laughs> bad. So uh, three yeah, hour Joe Rogan podcast about JFK's assassination. <laughs> he won, he's won one, two, three, four, five. Oh, sorry. Four Oscars. Mm. So he won one for Platoon for Best Picture and, and uh, director Best Director. It? And then he won for Best Director for Born on the Fourth of July, which uh, I think yeah. is kind of ridiculous. And then he was nominated for JFK, but then he won for Best Adapted Screenplay for uh, Midnight Express. Oh, 
Billy. Yeah. Which to m- I didn't see that movie until like two years ago, but I always quoted that because I watched The Cable Guy when I was a kid. <laughs> and <laughs> that mm. was what I thought. That's what I thought that movie was all about. <laughs> Which Didn't Marie Stiller of, yeah. show us Midnight Express in sound class in college? I don't know. Murray Stiller showed us a lot of movies in, in sound <laughs> class in college. I think he primarily showed us a lot of David Lynch movies because he was a freak. Dang ass <laughs> freak. He loved that. He loved that guy. And I do too. Like technically, yeah. like uh uh what's uh what's his name? I just said it. David Lynch had had has some really interesting sound stuff in his movies. Mm-hmm. Blue Velvet's just a crazy experimental soundscape. It's a powerhouse of a movie. Powerhouse. Michael, thank you so much for being on my eight-year anniversary episode and being my friend and uh, my brother and coming on me with this, coming on this journey, coming on me, coming on this journey with me. Okay. It's important that someone comes on you at, at every opportunity so that you can grow and thrive in your flower pot of... Oh. <laughs> fuck you gotta um after I, eight I really... years it ends on a semen <laughs> ah, what a f- wet fart i uh i i really appreciate you being on the show as much as you have and supporting me and uh being being on this episode um it was uh, i maybe i'll have you on next year and or maybe in eight more years somebody else can take the nine year anniversary but yeah you mm-hmm. got the eight year one nice. um is there anything that you're working that you worked on that you're allowed to talk about that you want to plug and tell people to go watch? Uh, I've been working on a voice portfolio of late. Um, if you all go on that Netflix and watch that uh, Army of the Dead or the prequel. Oh, uh, did you do that one too? Yeah. I want to see the prequel. It's it's interesting. It's what a uh, weird kind of thing to happen a with weird, a movie series. Exactly. And just, you know, you pick one character and the guy turns out to also be a director and he pitches an idea for it. And they're just like, cool, let's do it. They're like, yeah. all right. Uh, and Army Snyder's of Thieves, producing. It's uh, and if you watch it, y'all better turn on that descriptive video <laughs> and you'll hear something very familiar. <laughs> yeah, you'll hear this guy's voice. Yeah. 900 right. times. <laughs> yes. He picks up a chair. That's right. <laughs> He turns a corner. That's right. Um, he is surrounded. Gunfire fills the air. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mike, thank you so much. Um, and if anyone wants to hire you, say somebody listens to this and they like your voice, where can people get in contact with uh, you? You can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, uh, Michael Fournier. Name, Michael Fournier. There you go. Uh, or you can email me, m4nea at me.com. I work for scale. There you, there you go <laughs> as for me everyone you can email me at let's watch that podcast at gmail.com find me on twitter and instagram at, at let's watch pod don't forget to rate review subscribe go to brewk.ca and use the promo code let's watch pod to get five dollars off your order thank you to keenan federico of good comedy for the music for the podcast i love you and i appreciate you every day um michael again thank you so much for coming on the show And until next time, uh, L.A. story. We watched that.